going to bed and I will, I could cut that too and, and use it for mulch, um, whatever. Um, daikon radishes, they're actually called field radishes or cover crop radishes, but basically it's a daikon radish. Um, you may not have grown daikon radishes, but you've probably seen them in the store. They're long and sometimes really big. Um, they're, they're very strong. And so it's a really good cover crop to put on a soil that is very hard and very um, uh, compacted because they will grow into that soil and they winter kill. So it's a fall, uh, it's a fall cover crop and you're gonna get it on probably late summer, um, August, uh, September. You may not have a place to put these, um, but if you do have a place to put them and your soil is compacted, um, that daikon radish, uh, the plant dies. So basically that's created a hole in the ground in, in, to loosen your soil up. Um, so uh, very effective for loosening soil up. Now, uh, radishes are the same family as, uh, well, it's, it's a brassica family, cold crops. Um, so I do not use these in places where I'm going to have the brassica family because they can harbor diseases uh, or they can bring in diseases that will affect the, um, the, the uh, you know, the brassicas, brassicas being cabbage, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, things like that. Um, and as a matter of fact, I have a rotation in my garden. I don't actually use these in my own garden, but I do take care of our church garden and I use them extensively there because we have no brassicas in that rotation. I grow no brassicas there and we have compacted soil. Um, uh, John, I know you're on the call and you're going through that soil with your rotor till and you can tell people how hard that soil is. Yeah, my Troy build bounces around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I've been there when you're doing that. Okay. Uh, um, okay, yeah, I know what this is for. Uh, we talked about summer planting, uh, and this is the summertime, um, or it's early summer, maybe late spring, and, I, and I'm not going to do anything with this bed uh, until later in the summer. I think it's a place where I'm going to plant either uh, my fall brassicas or my late uh, crops like um, lettuces and whatnot that I want to take into the fall. So I don't want it to just sit there. It, it may have had clover on it. Uh, it looks like I've worked that soil and it might have been another cover crop in there, but I want to plant buckwheat. Uh, again, buckwheat likes warm soil. It germinates well in warm soil. It doesn't like cold. Uh, but that problem, and I think I already went over this, is that it, the soil is awful warm and dry in the, in the, I'm sorry, it's dry in the summertime. So I do use this cover. Uh, some of the other mulch uh, ideas I had, like the straw, w would help. Um, or just if you're around every day, water. I know some of us are, are in community gardens, but we're not there other than maybe once a week. Uh, so this will, will preserve moisture. And I'm going to talk about it again with fall crops. I use it when I plant fall crops because a lot of those are planted in the, in the um, summertime too. So here's buckwheat. Uh, probably... Uh, um, you can see actually this is a year that the moisture was probably pretty good because uh, um, right here there's actually a line. I just took off that row cover and the germination down here isn't much worse than the germination up here. It wasn't great germination uh, so it was probably dry enough but uh, it was probably a year when we had had rain. You know sometimes we get plenty of rain and sometimes sometimes we don't. Um, but that's probably about 10 days after planting. It's a very quick growing crop. Uh, and uh, this is probably uh, maybe 20 days after planting. Uh, and that's about three and a half to four weeks after planting. So it, it's, its advantage is, is that a very, very quick growing cover crop so you can get a crop in very quickly. And um, it's actually, it grows fast enough that it shades the soil and it outcompetes most weeds. So weeds will start to grow under there and they just don't get the sunlight. Um, this is even a better shot of that. Um, there's, there's no sun, very little sunlight going down to that soil. So any soil, any weeds have started to germinate. They may not have died, but they just won't grow enough. So they're you know very easy to control from there on when I get ready to, to manage this. Now, um, they say that buckwheat will provide you the most growth and do the best for um, controlling weeds when 10% of the crop has blossomed. Now, how do you know when 10% of the crop has blossomed, especially if you've never grown it before? 
This is probably getting up towards print percent. This one's probably more like 60 or 70 percent. So basically, if you, if you let 100% of the flowers grow and then go back a week and a half or whatever it was, then you know you should have done it a week ago. So I'm giving you these shots because this is probably a little bit past where you're getting it, your optimum effect, although um, I think it's still fine. Um, this is probably not quite, not quite there yet. Um, and if you have a couple of months that this bed is going to be open, you can actually get two crops of buckwheat in here. Um, uh, Buckwheat is one of those seeds that I've used, I've bought it and used it for five years and it, as long as I keep it in my cool basement in a jar or a coffee can, it seems to last forever. So, um, oops, going back too far, okay. Uh, so uh, I'm going to show you a little bit more about incorporation uh, with buckwheat in, in a bit. Okay, this happens to be a buckwheat crop, the one that was probably about 60% blue in blue. Oh, by the way, if you, if you um, eat it, Cut this off. Now, I've cut it. I happen to have a scythe. Uh, Allie, you, yes, go ahead. Kelly's asking, is the buckwheat seed the same thing that we eat? It is. But I think the buckwheat seed that we eat has the shell taken off. and It'll probably rot. Uh, the, the buckwheat, um, it's kind of like what is triangular, I guess. Uh, it's in a shell. It's, it's triangular. Um, it's, it's, it's black and if you buy grouts at the at a, like a health food store in, in the bulk bins, it I think the shell's been taken off, um, but I'm not positive about that. So uh, yeah, you probably can't plant the same thing you buy at the health food store. I wouldn't say that about wheat or um, or rye. If if you you know if they if you buy that from the bulk bins in the health food store, it's probably perfectly viable. Um, I'm gonna say good question. Um, so I, I cut this, uh, if you have a lawnmower, you can go over, it. well, it's kind of hard to go over the lawn, but it's a little bit too thick, I think. And, and I uh, uh, went over this last week for those that missed it. I don't use any power tools in my garden. I don't want to teach somebody how to garden by having to rely, having have you rely on power tools. Uh, and so if you have a way to cut this, um, uh, I happen to have a side. That, that, this is really easy to cut. It's, it's got a very succulent stem. Uh, side and machete or some other implement like that would, would work fine. Um, I could chop this into the soil because it is so succulent, but in this particular case, it was so, so heavy that I uh, took it to the compost pile. Uh, yeah, again, you can do the same. I would suggest if you have a really good cover crop to cut it with something first. And then a lawnmower will, will work okay for clover, I think. Um, but, uh, and then you have the choice. You can either rake it up and take it to the compost pile if you think it's too thick, too hard to get through with your, your hoe or, or rotor till or whatever. Um, or you can, you, you can take it to the compost. This is basically a clover you just saw cut. I took it to the compost pile. Uh, it looks like I've probably kind of um, forked it in a little bit. Um, and, uh, or you can use it for mulch elsewhere in the garden. Uh, early, um, early onions, uh, I think maybe it's garlic. Uh, I took another co clover cover crop that I cut down and I brought it someplace else where I'm going to use it. So, um, I, again, I don't use a rotor tiller. Uh, I'm not saying don't use a rotor tiller, but I wrote, uh, talked about this last week. And I know, John, you had, with the rotor tiller, you weren't on the call, but it can kind of pulverize your soil and cause compaction in the long run. So, I just mm -hmm. use a hoe. Um, I chop it in. Now, some of your cover crops, uh, particularly this is one of the grasses or probably a clump of rye, they can be tough to handle. So I, even though I went over this with something to cut it, I might have to cut a little bit more with my, with my hoe. I do occasionally sharpen my hoe with a, with a file. I don't get it razor sharp by any means, but I think it just helps to have it a little bit, um, a little bit sharp. Uh, and, and sometimes I'll have to chop up these clumps um, several times. When you get it to this clump stage, I try to chop that up a little bit more, but eventually I want to make sure I at least uproot it. So you can see I've kind of uprooted those clumps and I will chop more at the bottom and, it, and it, um, it's not going to kill it immediately. I usually have to um, hoe a, um, a cover crop bed about three or four times. And I like to let it sit about a week before uh, between hoeings. That allows the soil to dry out. It allows the crop that, that 
the part of the crop that died to, to turn brown. So I'll see, I can see what's still green, what's still alive. Um, but generally a, a good cover crop, I say three or four times, I, I, I plan on four times. If I am going to plant this bed, I will try to start about a month ahead of time, or at least three weeks ahead of time and start um, chopping that, that in. Now, um, at what point do you, uh, you know, do you take it to the compost pile or do you try to chop it in? This is, uh, let's see, it's uh, a crop of rye in, in vetch. It's just a little bit more than a foot high. I did chop that in, I think is what the shots you just saw without taking it to the compost pile. But um, this crop is about two feet high and I'm not gonna try to chop that in. I'm gonna cut that off take to the compost pile. So I am actually removing some of the fertility that I'm growing for this bed, but I'm gonna be bringing it back in the form of, of compost. I'm actually making more compost because I, uh, you know, I'm taking more of the compost pile. Now, um, notice that that is really green. Um, it means it's, it's got a lot of nitrogen in it. Typically your composting uh, is a balance of carbon and nitrogen that the bacteria need in order to, to um, to break things down. So when I take this to the compost pile, it's a little bit high in nitrogen. So this happens to be a spring shot. You can see the blueberries are in the background. So uh, I, I may not have a lot of leaves left over to, to mix in. Car leaves and anything brown is, is high in carbon. So if you do have a way to save some leaves from the, um, from the fall, uh, it's good to mix in. I know, uh, our, we can't throw our paper egg cartons in recycling anymore, but so I've been tearing those up and putting them in for some extra carbon. Uh, I don't see any drawback to that, and uh, it's a good way to reuse those too. Uh, so this is a bed uh, that was just hoed one time, uh, and, and it was, uh, I actually did take the tops of off, the clover, I either brought it to the compost pile or I used it for mulch, I don't remember which, um, and I hoed it up, and you can see it's green. There's a lot of green in there, but that, a lot of that stuff is dead. So um, this is a week after I did a second hoeing of that same bed. Um, and I've killed about everything, uh, but there's still a few things in there and things are really starting to break down because it's, they're high in nitrogen, they're fairly succulent, so they do break down fairly quickly in the soil. So this is gonna be hoed two more times. I probably, I probably hoed it the same day. Again, it's a week after that I hoed it the last time and. At that point, I, I didn't know I didn't kill everything. So now I know it to, to go in and make sure I uprooted all those, those clovers that were left. Um, this is a bed uh, that was, uh, again, it was not clover, it was a, uh, an oak bed. Uh, I think you saw a picture of it earlier. Uh, I'm sorry, I was, it was winter rye. And I just hoed it the first time. A lot of, um, you know, a lot of green there. Now my beds are 30 foot, 30 foot long. And I'm fairly fit and I only use a hoe and it takes me about 25 to 30 minutes to hoe after the cover crop, the first hoeing after the cover crop. And so, you know, that's um, a considerable amount of time and you can go slower, uh, you know, break it up because it, it, it is a little bit strenuous. Um, but I'm finding after the first hoeing, uh, the second hoeing takes about 10 to 15 minutes and then each hoeing after that is, is like 10 minutes or less. So as the things break down, as you've uh, loosened the soil up, um, you, you've made it easier for yourself. If, you, you know, if your beds are not that big, you can adjust your time. But um, I, don't, I don't think 30 minutes is an, an ordinary amount of time. And as you see here, I plant different things at different times. So, I'm not doing these all on one day. I'm doing, you know, I may do one one week, a couple weeks later, I may do another. Um, what is a little more problematic is these beds that, that were planted to the perennial rye. This is a perennial rye grass. This is what some of your lawn would look like if you didn't cut it. Um, and this is a bed that the clover got taken over and clover didn't do that well. So this um, is a little bit harder to handle. Um, and you, you've got to cut the tops off. You might be able to get over it with a lawnmower. You might have to take it off in, a, in another way. And then the clumps are much denser. It's great for loosening up soil. This is, I, I wish I could just leave this here, 
Um, but I've got to get it out to get my crops in. And you can see there's just a tangle of roots in, in uh, the lower parts of the plant. Um, so uh, this is probably the second time I will have been through it, or maybe I just did it, hold it once, and I'm about to do a second time. But those tangles are, um, they're, they're hard to manage. Eventually, I find some I really can't get through. And I, I rake them together and I drag them over the, the edge of, the, of my bed. That's the place going, you know, where it slopes down to the pathway. And they kind of mulch the edge of the, edge of the bed and they eventually will break down and disappear. By the end of the season, I forgot, well, I've forgotten I did that. So it, it is a, a way you can manage those. Uh, let's see, uh, I have that in there for, okay, yeah. All right, so uh, the, the, the goal is not to grow cover crops, it's, it's to grow cover crops so you can get your crops in. So this is a, a bed that's been hoed four times. It's just about ready. Um, there's some things that haven't quite broken down. I probably, I might try to rake them out, but I don't think there's enough that is gonna take up too much of the nitrogen from the soil. As I mentioned before, I, I rake the leaves back and then I'll drag a little bit of soil up from the side. Uh, and then I'll rake it, um, I'll rake it with a hoe, rake it flat with a hoe. Um, I also um, will do a little bit of uh, loosening the soil every year. Um, <clears throat> I try, when, even when I'm hoeing uh, the cover crop in, uh, I try not to go too deep. I don't want to um, dis disturb the soil uh, too, too far down. Uh, so I do go over it with a digging fork. This is a digging fork. It's, um, it's referenced on your resources. It used to be sold by Smith & Hawken. I think Smith & Hawken went out of business. Um, it's actually manufactured by the, I think the Bulldog Tool Company, which is English. Um, it's, it's about the strongest one made. <clears throat> uh, the American Garden Tool Company, which is again in your resources, you want to, might, might, might want to make a note of that. They make a really strong one. It's shaped a little bit differently. The, the, the teeth are a little bit wider uh, and they're not quite as, as deep. So it's not quite as strong for, for, um, uh, for, um, for digging, but uh, it should do fine. Now I'm going to move you on. I hopefully, hopefully it's moving on your end. So basically this is what I do to the whole bed. Um, beds are about 30, uh, about three feet wide, maybe a little bit more or less. So I go down uh, three or four times, you know, so I cover the whole bed just to make sure the soil is loose. Um, and uh, uh, there, are, there are tools for doing this that are a little more efficient. Uh, Johnny's uh, Selected Seed sells these, um, uh, what do you call them, Nagisa? Uh, oh, broad forks, I'm sorry. Uh, there's different shapes. This is one with tines that are fairly narrow. Uh, there, are one, there are models that are wider, so they have more tines, but they're meant to, she's actually walking backwards. So she's not walking on the area that she's just loosened. But she's kind of doing similar to what I, I did with my fork. Um, if you have a good fork, <laughs> I wouldn't go out and spend the money on this, but uh, Johnny's was nice enough to um, provide us with these photos. And so I you know, put in a good plug for them. If you have a large area, um, these are not just used by gardeners. There are a lot of farmers that grow in beds. They use these also. Matter of fact, I think they're probably used more by farmers than, than gardeners. And they have different type, types of teeth. This is what you call a, um, uh, not a sod buster, but uh, it's used for compacted soil. I think it's maybe a compacted soil. It, its teeth are, are thicker uh, and, and uh, it, it, it does a better job in really compacted soil. Uh, um, so again, I don't, uh, I do not have um, a broad fork, but I, I find that my digging fork works fine. You know, it's not worth the investment. If i starting out, I might, might buy one of those. So basically, I'm going to just rake the top of the soil. Um, I don't know if that video worked the first time. Did everyone see that? It worked. It, it, yeah. did, it worked. yeah, the small fork. Yes, we saw it. Good. All right. Sorry. Yeah. 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 All right. So basically, this was a video too, but not, not much to it. Basically, just raking the, 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 surface, um, the surface flat. Uh, and um, okay. So... Uh, you know, I guess that. So once I rake the surface flat, uh, I'm ready to plant. And we talked about planting last week, so we're kind of going backwards, but I wanted to do that one first because uh, I know people wanted to start planting things. So I am going to look at a couple of things. Um, this is my 
soil test. Oops, sorry. This is my soil test uh, from 2006. I started this. I started this garden in 2006. So I've been through a year. So I had added a few inputs, but there's a couple of things I want you to look at. So here's the year 2006. And let's see, I want you to look at the organic matter, 3.3. It was done from the whole garden. I took, you know, several samples around. So it wasn't just from one spot. Uh, and let's see, and the pH uh, on the left-hand side is 6.7. Okay. Uh, nutrients are pretty good. Magnesium is a little bit low, but I, I'm not too worried about that. Uh, uh, I don't usually worry about uh, the, um, you know, these nutrients as much. Uh, you, you asked that really good question last week, Jerry. What are the three things I look for on a soil test? One, <laughs> and the two things I look for, definitely the organic matter and the pH. Uh, you know, if, if there's a warning, it goes very low, then I'll, I'll, I'll maybe have to uh, think about uh, doing something different. But generally with, with a mixed compost, you get these in, in fairly good uh, percentages uh, or amounts, uh, balance, I guess I should say. Uh, <clears throat> you don't have to worry. Okay, now, this is, uh, okay. Uh, if you're not following my pen, hopefully, it's shown. okay, there's the date. So this is uh, nine years later. And let's see, this is pretty much the same area. I say beds two to seven. I think maybe I had something growing permanently on bed one. So I didn't do that, but uh, pH has gone up a bit. Um, and, uh, but so has in the organic matter. Uh, there's a couple of things that are a little low here. Uh, potassium tends to get low in the fall, so I'm not worried about that because it's it's very soluble, uh, and it's usually in pretty good amounts for for compost. So when I add my compost the next year, if I took a spring test, I'm, I'm almost positive that phosphorus would be up there. So not alarming. Sodium don't really need that much. Uh, I'm not worried about that. Uh, so again, what I'm looking at here is is my pH uh, has gone up a little worrisome, uh, but so has it my um, uh, my organic matter. Now, um, <clears throat> uh, Kathy, uh, I think it's Dendrick who gave a uh, berries workshop at the um, NOFA conference this past year. I talked to her a little bit about this, about my soil, and she said, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about the high pH if your organic matter is high, because uh, it kind of, you know, the problems with high pH are probably going to be buffered by the organic matter. Um, so, yeah, again, there's, I think I went over them last week, there's a lot of reasons I want to see that organic matter go up there. There's nutrients in there. Um, it's making my soil looser. Um, it's, um, you know, and when it makes it looser, it allows uh, better penetration, uh, easier penetration of water. Um, and actually, I'm storing carbon. Uh, I'll, I'll show you in the next, there's a little bit better demonstration in the next slide. Now, this is a, um, a, a private lab. I've use a lot. I like them. Uh, but, you know, some of us, many of us are master gardeners, I know. And um, this is actually, uh, I think it was the same year. I think it is. Uh, so this is actually the same soil sample I sent to Rutgers. And again, there's the year. And uh, the, the, uh, they got the exact same rating for the, well, you know, they were a little more detailed for the pH. And the organic matter, uh, 5.7, I think the other one, yeah, exactly. So um, I think Rutgers is a little less expensive than some of the private labs. And I, um, I have always gotten uh, good results. This basically shows that there's no difference. Uh, it's possible that with Rutgers, the, uh, the organic matter is an add-on. You may, it may not come in the basics. So any master gardeners on, on here that, um, that know that one, Answer that question one way or the other. Have to unmute yourself, but okay. So um, just be careful if you send to Rutgers just to. Um, Hi. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I am yep. a master gardener um, yep. with um, Rutgers Cooperative Extension in Middlesex County. Um, yes. And I just did, um, actually, I just, I get soil tests done every year because I rotate around my yard. What I can do is I can look at the soil test right now, but it is, I think it is an add on. The way you have it here, it's an add-on. Okay. Um, yep. But I can, I'd have to research, like I'd have to look to see how much extra 
um, somebody would be charged just to find out about the organic matter. Oh yeah. So is that what you wanted? Did you want the yes, price? Yes, or? Th yes, thank you. Yeah, and I think I think I have also heard that if you um, tell a white lie and say you're a farm rather than a um, than a garden, that they may automatically put that organic matter in. I don't know that for a fact, but uh, Rutgers um, agronomist told me to, to do that. So. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't know if the, if the farm um, price is any different than the garden price. I'm, I'm not really sure. So basically, I'm kind of putting a plug in here for Rutgers. Um, uh, do, do a fine job. Um, um, Al, Maurice yeah. is asking if she has a pH of 6.01, what should she do? 6.0? Well, I, the ideal pH is between 6 and 7. Now, um, I'm sorry, yeah, 6 and 7. or You know, 6.5 is actually ideal. So um, 6 isn't bad. But um, things that will will make your um, uh, you will raise your pH would be would be limestone, carbon, um, eggshells. Um, when the soil uh, records agronomist saw my my nine year test, he said, "Well, if you want to lower your pH, stop putting eggshells in your compost." which I have, but I, I don't know how, how it's affected because I haven't taken a, a, a pH test in a few years. So, you know, certainly you know, put things that are high carbon uh, into, your, into your compost, or if you want to just put them in the garden. I know, uh, you know, once in a, in a blue moon, we'll have lobster, uh, and I just bury the lobster shells right in the garden, and I cannot find them the next year. So if you have an open space, that's, you know, again, it's high in calcium, it's, it, and, it, and, it, and it, uh, calcium will raise the pH. Um, was that kind of the question, Nagisa? I think so, yeah. Okay. Then the follow-on question was, what's the optimal or level of organic matter? Well, I can say I would be concerned if it was under three, um, but I don't know that there's any, any top level that you need to worry about. Um, some of what I call the muck soils, which are basically, old, I think they're old peat bogs. There's a couple of uh, these areas in New York State, and you know there's at least one in Ohio. Um, their their um, organic matter is about 15 to 20 percent, and they say they're really productive soils. Although the more you cultivate them, the, they they um, decompose and they kind of drop. Um, so the, the land it actually gets lower and lower. Um, one one thing about those soils, though, is they dry out really quickly. So maybe if you have too much organic matter, um, you, you might have an issue. Now, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think Mike is on the call. Mike, who is our uh, president, no, if his president, um, I've, I've taken samples of his soil. Uh, because he he tries to practice no-till methods and he's he's raised his pH from uh, I have his old soil test in 1993 where it was like less than three and there's areas in his farm now that are up above eight eight percent organic matter and they're they're productive so I don't think that it hurts to get up really high and um, I, maybe afterwards I can I can show you how much carbon Mike has sequestered or any of us sequester um, let me go back to that uh, Rutgers slide. Oh, this is the Rutgers slide. Oh, while right. you're looking yes, go ahead, Jerry. something real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I think something everyone really wants from a test is a definitive answer of what should I do, what is good, what is bad. And that's not how farming works, and it's not how nature works. So when you've tested, the next thing to do is grow. And if you're so far off, like you're in, in the low fives on the edge of those yellows, that's a problem. But otherwise, stuff wants to grow. And by growing, you're going to start fixing the soil anyways. So a low cost way to fix things is to grow. If they're really, really failing, see how they're failing and then address those particular issues. But like Al is getting to with his particular examples, everything is going to mitigate another thing. So when your question is, what should I do? I have 15 questions about what type of soil you have. How big is your growing space? How much money are you willing to put in? Are you organic certified? You know, all of these things build into the answer to your question. So for each individual person, 
it's completely different. And the only thing that's standard between all of us is grow because stuff wants to live. That's what I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That's good. Um, <clears throat> okay. One more thing I want you to look at on this Rutgers test is, um, uh, let's see. Okay. See down here where it says organic matter, I, I highlighted that before, but it says organic carbon 3.3%. What the heck does that mean? Well, <clears throat> organic matter is 58% carbon. Uh, when it's fully broken down. And I don't know where that, you know, how, how that's figured, but, um, but it seems to be fairly consistent. And if you did the math there, it is 15%, I've, I've, I'm, in, I'm sorry, 58%. So it's about half carbon. Where did that carbon come from? That carbon almost all came from photosynthesis. Some of it might've been uh, added as uh, calcium carbonate, which is limestone. Um, from or maybe eggshells, but I've done some calculations and the, the amount of that 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 could add to the organic matter so it's really minute. So it mostly came from photosynthesis. What is what is photosynthesis? Well a plant takes a carbon dioxide atom, which again is um let's see carbon dioxide. So it's two oxygen um, molecule two oxygen atoms and a carbon atom and it releases the um the um oxygen and it takes in the carbon that's what it builds sugars with that's what it builds the plant with and <clears throat> that uh that carbon dioxide molecule is 28 percent carbon so it's, it's about a quarter carbon so the carbon that that eventually got into this soil represents three times the amount in, in its weight of car i say four times the amount of weight in it is, is a carbon dioxide molecule because the carbon dioxide molecule is only a quarter carbon. So I've sequestered, the fact that I've raised my organic matter by 2.4%, I think, 2 point something percent, I've, uh, and I can do the calculations, the math is fairly easy, but I've sequestered a fair amount of carbon dioxide that's now in my soil that's no longer in the atmosphere. And so another really important aspect of organic gardening or farming is that we're, we're helping the environment to take some of that carbon out of the atmosphere, carbon dioxide. But yeah, thanks for your comments, Eric. So this is a little bit in answer to that question also, Nikisa. Um, <clears throat> let me get my pen out again. Uh, this happened to have been taken the year before some of those soil tests you saw, uh, 2014, but it's about the same time period. And this is my raspberry patch. If you remember my raspberries, I only put on leaves. I put on about eight inches of leaves a year. That's the only fertility that's ever had. And it's, uh, let's see, it's pH is even higher than my garden. I think my garden was 7.1, this is 7.3. Um, but the organic matter is 7.6. That's going up a heck of a lot more. Uh, that's up almost two percent higher than than my than my regular garden. Um, so part of the question of how to raise your pH, uh, leaves ha actually have a lot of carbon in them. It, it's what gives the leaf its structure. So when those break down, that stays right in the soil. So that if your soil is six and you want to um, try to try to raise the pH. Um, using leaf mulch and letting that just rot right there will 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 help. Um, now you might look at this and say, what about your boron? Your boron was low. Well, I, I actually got myself into trouble. I tried putting a little bit of boron uh, on one time. There is borons that mine minerals, so it's actually loud and organic. And I put too much on some of some of the raspberry patch, and I actually killed the raspberries. It's it's um, as you see some of the results in parts per million. There's like sulfur is 1902, boron is 0.2. The soil just needs a little bit of boron, uh, so it's it and it's toxic. It's uh, you know it's what's used for a lot of ant baits and made of boric acid. Um, so um, yes, go ahead. Um, I, it's like it's after eight now, so I'm just wondering. Oh. We've run over quite a bit, so I'm wondering yeah. how close you are to the end. Ah, uh, this could be the last slide. Okay, good. Yeah. I, I had a couple. I was going to show you some 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 uh, ideas I had for for not killing. But um, they're kind of in process, so I, I think I could skip that. And if anybody wants to go over and question the answer, so yeah, thanks. So so basically, uh, again, a, 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 um, a soil scientist, um, agronomist said, "Don't worry about that boron." Said you've got so much organic matter in there. There's going to be enough boron tied up in there that um, 
uh, I, I wouldn't worry about the boron. And, and I said, I wouldn't worry too much about the pH because of the high organic matter. But uh, um, yeah, so I haven't changed my fertility aside from trying a little bit of boron here. Yeah, I could, I could end right there, Nagisa. Um, I guess I talked too much. No, 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 that's great. But I think we can continue on next time. Sure. Yeah, and I will hang on. I will unshare my screen. Right. Uh, let's see, I gotta get out of this pen. I have to... Okay, so I think I can unshare my screen. Oh, here. Okay, st stop sharing. Okay. Good. Um, so if you want to, uh, you know, if you want to go eat, fine. Uh, I'll hang on for as long as there's questions. And I, I um, encourage everybody to come next week. We'll talk about pests, which will include weeds. And then um, the, the last session is going to be um, fairly advanced. I, I know it's not so advanced that if you're new, you, you won't get something out of it. But uh, I, I, one of my expertise, because I used to grow commercially, I mean, I mean not commercially, but I used to farm, um, is growing in the fall because I did a lot of restaurant business. So I, I'm pretty good about stretching the season. And, and you saw a shot last week of what my kale looked like last week. Uh, we're, we're harvesting a lot of kale right now. Uh, planted last July. So I, I, I guess if you have some friends that are experienced gardeners and they haven't joined us, um, they may want to join us for that last that last session. I think you can register by the session. So um, so for those of you dropping off, thanks for, for joining. And um, uh, But I'll, I'm here for questions. Thanks, Al. Okay. Um, thanks, Al. Al. Sure. Uh, thanks. Go ahead. Oh, uh, thank you. I have a question. Um, I do. Um, I don't exactly cover crop because I have boxes, raised beds. Yes. Um, and normally, what I I do have a lot of leaves though, even though I have small beds. And so what I'll do is, um, I guess leaf mold, um, where I take the leaves, I put them in geo bins. I have a compost crank, and I sort of crank it um, every few days, and the leaves sort of. Um, deteriorate and then I throw that on my boxes usually yeah. at the end of the season um, but then if I do need to add more compost than what I have I'll use like crop builder or something that's from Maine mm -hmm. um, I put about two inches on and then I'll use like a fork or something just to loosen the soil I don't till at all like I don't believe in all of that mm -hmm. my question is um, um, and then I got my um, soil test results back um, my pH was a little bit low but I wasn't very concerned I, it said I didn't need much fertilizer in my beds either um, but my question is, um, in terms, is that really, um, I guess, sustainable to add a little bit of crop builder or, cause I buy the crop builder usually from Belmead, um, over in Hillsboro. Um, is that sustainable over time or should I just ramp up, I guess, my production of compost? That's my question. Uh, well, I think if you ramp up your production of compost, you probably wouldn't need the, um, the, the sustainer. Uh, I think that isn't that stuff made like partially with like lo uh, lobster composted lobster or something like that. Yeah, it's yeah. made with um, composted. Lo it's it's um, actually used for organic farming, so yeah. it, it is. Um, it, yeah. But it's but it's it it has all sorts of um, stuff with a carbon backbone in it, and my plants love it. Like I haven't, I've never had a problem with it, and it's mm -hmm. one of Bell Mead's number one sellers. Mm -hmm. However. Um, um, I'm thinking if I ramp up my compost production, maybe I wouldn't need it, but I don't also have a lot of space. Yeah, I think so, you probably won't need it, but um, uh, at least not need it every year. Because it sounds like okay. you get a pretty good fertility program. Um, you know, it, it, if, you, if you look at mine and compared yours to mine, you know, maybe your, your purchase uh, it, it would make up for the fact that you don't have a cover crop. But then again, if you're, using, if you're making your own leaf mold, that's, that's going to provide a lot of your fertility too. Yeah, the leaf mold was good in that it provided fertility, a lot of earthworms and it great aeration, which is why I don't need to, that's what the leaf mold did, but I felt like I needed a little bit more to top the box in yeah. the spring than what my leaf mold provided, which is why I use the crop builder, but at the same time, I don't use a cover crop. Mm -hmm. So Maybe you're right. Maybe it does offset the cost. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think if it's if it's compost. Uh, I, again, that's largely organic matter, and I don't think you can put too much on. The question is whether whether it's worth it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's something you probably have to experiment. Again, your, your best 
the best book you can buy is a diary. <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> because I have been making notes to see, and I have reduced the amount of crop builder I had to buy every year. Um, I've been able to reduce it, but then again, I also put in elderberry shrubs, which needed more compost. So I think because I'm putting in yeah. more things, I'm needing more of my own compost, and then yeah. I still wind up buying crop builder. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Out of curiosity, is this a commercial operation? Are you selling anything you're growing? Um, Adara? Yes? Are you, are you selling anything you're growing? No, I don't. I actually use it just for my family. Okay, so um, I don't, I use almost everything that I grow for my own family, for okay. us to eat off of, from spring through fall, even the elderberries, um, I have some um, alnifolia, like service berry there, um, yeah. and then ground cherry. So I use it for a combination of the birds, the animals, to keep them away from my garden, right. and partially for myself. Like um, I make my own elderberry syrup and stuff for my children. Uh, so no, I don't sell anything. It's just the, us eating. The reason I ask is because if you're selling it, it's a lot easier to do a cost analysis. You can just say, what mm -hmm. am I selling it for by unit? And then what are my inputs? And then you can see what's worth it and what's not worth it for the yield difference. Gotcha. Uh, because you're not selling it, you don't have a yeah. price associated with it. So you well, my price associated with it is the supermarket. <laughs> right. So yeah, you would have a comparable substitute to get the same utility, which is just like thinking economically about it. So if you're thinking, quote unquote, is it worth it? That's how I would justify if it was worth it or not. You know? Got you. Got Just you. Put a price tag on it, put in all of your inputs, calculate how much time you spend on it. And then mm -hmm. if there's a difference in yield from your meta analysis that Al's describing of keeping a journal, then you'll know and you can measure that. You know, if it's 5% more for 50 more dollars, then it's $10 for each percentage point. And Ooh. you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, I got what you're saying. Simple, and especially because you're in a raised bed, it's such a contained, perfect space to measure where so many people are kind of like, I don't know, it's like 33 and a half square feet and I grow like a third of it. You know what I mean? Whereas you. it's perfect to do that kind of analysis. So I like numbers. So that's what I would do if you're trying to find if it's worth it. Yeah, that other, sounds like a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, the other numbers there is a, a soil test. And it's... it's, it's um, now, Jerry mentioned there's a lot of questions you have to ask about a soil test, but there's a lot of answers it provides too. And I, my main reason for looking at my soil test is not to see how much phosphorus I have. It's just to see how my, what changes made over, over a period of time. So, you know, before and after ones are, are really good, space them a few years apart. And then you can answer your question yourself. Oh, have, how often I, do you soil test? Did you, uh, have, do you have annual? Me, I, I, I waited almost 10 years before I did a, uh, a before and after. Uh, really? I wanted to take one when I started out. I think that's really good. Uh, you know, maybe too late for a lot of us now, but when you start out to take one, uh, because then whatever you use for fertility, uh, then you can take one in a few years and, um, you know, and, and be able to compare. Wow. Uh, I, I, I need to take another one just because I need to see if my pH is going up or down from, yeah. from my new program. I know my, my organic matter is good. I don't imagine that's going to have changed much, maybe, maybe even gone up, but I'm, I'm really happy with where it was. But I, I do have a question about the pH. And I may just get a pH test. I think they're, they're cheaper. Do you ever use strips to test pH? What's that? Do you ever use strips to test pH? No, I, no. I, I, I'm not sure I trust their accuracy, but I, I think that, uh, that there are – pH meters that are pretty accurate, but they're, you know, $120 or something yeah, like that. So have different. you, have you tried the test strips? Um, I'm comfortable with strips for kitchen applications for testing like acidity levels in sanitation. Um, and they're, you know, health inspectors like those. So I feel, I, I have no philosophical issues with them. But I just feel like if I'm going to spend the time and energy to test, I want the full test. But I also test, I mean, twice a year, hmm. three times a year, if I can, just because right now I'm trying to key it in. But I mean, uh, we're also 
making a living here. So yeah, a little different. So can I just um, ask a couple of questions? The well, the, the simple one is other than the organic mushroom compost from Rosedale Mills, I have quite a few larger beds that I'm trying to put in. Um, I have, I guess this goes hand in hand. I have used um, our chickens to till garden spaces for us. Um, and part of the question is, is there anywhere local where I can buy organic compost by the yard besides yeah. the mushroom compost? That's the first question, I guess. Well, you, you live in Hopewell Township, I believe. Correct? Yes, Pennington. Yeah, now, do you have a truck? Yeah, well, yes, we have a pickup truck, yes. Okay, uh, so Hopewell has an arrangement with Lawrence Township mm -hmm. that we're supposed to be able to get compost from them. Now, I get, I have gone over, when I, when I made that, what I call the Johnson Sioux, the round compost thing, I went over and got a bunch of buckets. And, the, and the, the guys that work in the yard didn't know anything about the agreement. But the fact that I was just bringing buckets in, I mean, some large buckets, some, some uh, you know, trash size buckets, they didn't care. But, you know, they, they kind of say, oh, well, we don't know about that. And they said, you know, you're only going to get buckets, that's fine. Now, if you, uh, if you go over with a truck, um, they'll load you up for $12. Now, again, they're probably going to give you the hard time. You just have to say, you know, our, our townships, I think it's the environmental commissions have this agreement that we can get stuff over there. Cause I think our, our leaves in Hobo Township go there. And it, it may be true for, um, you know, others you, you know, in the area too, but um, that would probably be pretty good. I, I, I like their, their leaf mold over there. Okay. Um, I don't remember, yeah, I think, I think it's probably ready now. I think if you go in the fall and they may say, no, it's just composting. It may be a little harder to get, but yeah, now is the time everybody goes. And I, I'm no mention, a lot of people are, are traveling out too far, but you can go over there without any social contact, I think, if you're getting a, a, a truck filled. Okay. Where's that? And then the other question, the, I'm sorry? Where was that again? I just want to write it down. Uh, it's in Mercer County at uh, Hopewell Township in Lawrence Township. Uh, okay. But there are other, are, are other uh, a lot of other townships that are, that are um, composting. Um, Double Brook Farm in Hopewell is also kind of up and down on this project, but they're trying to do a composting oh, farm. Oh, good. Okay. Is it for sale or for giveaway? Yeah, they're doing composting tea, which will be certified, and their compost will be for sale. I don't know if it'll be this year, Yeah. Um, but they have quite a bit of it, and they... When I worked there, they had a whole lake's worth of dredged material, plus all of the composted material from all the animals processed and then all the other stuff on the farm. And everything, from someone who worked there, nothing is sprayed. It's all, they're not certified, but it's very trustworthy. Right. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the, the other question I have is, because I'm using chickens to till our gardens, um, some of them, you know, you just sort of let them bald, bald it out and scratch it out. Um, and the question is, should I add compost to that place after them? Do I need to add compost and do I have to till it in or can I just plant something that, you know, prefers a higher nitrogen? I know normally you, you wouldn't plant directly, obviously you wouldn't put chicken manure directly into your your uh, beds for because of burning but is that still the same when it's actually on the ground for some well, time well there's a couple of issues there um w with organic certification um raw manure has to be applied at least 90 days before a crop can be called certified organic that's one that grows out of the ground a root crop like carrots has to be 120 days um but you're not you know we're probably not looking for certification right now but the reason that was done is just for um uh, some of the microbes are, uh, you know, they have to balance out. They have, they have to have a chance for the bad ones to be decomposed. So it, there can be a, a risk of um, uh, getting sick, I guess. Uh, I don't know how, how much that risk is. Um, so incorporating into the soil will help the, 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 to um, uh, speed up the process of decomposition. I wouldn't, I wouldn't just leave it on the top of the soil. Um, and then again, if you put some, some additional compost on, that would probably help to speed that up too. Now, uh, I, I, this is actually a really good question. Um, 
because I had, and when I farmed, I used a lot of manure. Uh, mm -hmm. And some of it was fresh and others, some of it had a chance to compost. But I never found that it was, uh, it, it would produce as good crops as a, 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 a mixed compost, you know, stuff that had, may have manure in it, but it had a lot of different things. So um, even though chicken manure is really, you know, it's high in nitrogen, it's high in phosphorus, um, has some has potassium in it, it's, it's got a lot of good stuff in it. Um, I don't know that it's, I'm not sure why manure is not as, as good. I think maybe there's a lot of other micronutrients that are, you know, that are in your, your garbage or, you know, maybe in the plants that you, you threw in there from last year. Um, so, I, I, so I guess what I'm saying is it wouldn't hurt for you to get, uh, to, to supplement that with some, um, some compost. And, and when I say 90 days, that's 90 days of harvest. So, so in other words, if you're putting tomatoes in there, um, you know, if, if you had the chicken, I don't know, maybe you had them on last fall. I'm not sure if you have them on now. Yeah, I moved um, them off at, for the, at the end of the winter. They've been off since. Yeah, so I mean, the tomatoes are probably not going to pr start producing until three yeah. you know, months after that. So, uh, but again, you're not looking for certification, but you are, there is that, that health issue. Right, okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I used, I used to use chickens to, to prepare the soil too. And that was before certification. So. <laughs> There wasn't that issue, but you know, when I when the certification came out, I said, "Well, maybe I wasn't being too careful about the, about the health." So maybe to use the chickens in the fall and then cover it for the following. Yeah, in spring. the fall. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Another thing to consider is quality in, quality out. You know, mm -hmm. quality of the poop is going to be just as good as the quality of the feed. So if you're spending cents on feed, which a lot of people do for chickens because it's cheap, especially if you're not certified. It's going to be lower quality poop. And right. If you spend really like a ton of money on the feed. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. it's it's good quality poop. I would um, like to eventually for super organic. So it's, 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 but it's expensive. Yeah. 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 Believe me, I buy it. So I get it. <laughs> um, but one thing I didn't hear you guys talk about was running it over a cover crop. Oh, okay. So like, um, like rotation crimping, basically. So you, you cover crop and then you roll a chicken tractor over it and rolling the chicken tractor over it crimps it. And then the, the uh, chickens eat the cover crop, poop, and then you rotate them off and then you're gonna mulch it anyways and let it decompose. So you have your timeline and then you plant into it. Okay. That's what I do, at least. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. But I agree wholeheartedly with Al. I mean, it's it's just incomplete. It's like one aspect of compost. And the other thing, when everyone's asking about compost, um, Vermont compost is the best compost. In the world. Like, if you really want the best compost, buy Vermont compost. I, I just don't. Yeah. Think yeah. Want. But again, it's a price factor. So. You know, it's the Cadillac, you're spending for a Cadillac, you're paying trucking for a Cadillac. But to plug NOFA, NOFA does do a cost share program in the fall and everyone can buy in to do it. And if you're looking for organic grains, Lakeview Organic Grains out of Penyan, New York, sells through Scott Morgan, who is also part of NOFA. Um, and they do very high quality, really, really good um, grain feed. I'm sorry, you said it sells through who? Scott Morgan of Morganics Family Farm. Oh, right. Okay, that's what I thought you said. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know his wine. Yeah. Don't tell him I sent you, though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, uh, I think what, what Jared was referring to was a bulk order, um, which NOFA does, NOFA New Jersey does, but I, I know I see people on the call from New York or whatever. Uh, but you may have to order by the pallet, which you might not be able to afford. Um, but there's usually, you know, you, you know other farmers around. Uh, and you can usually buy a bag of stuff from them. I, I, I can't vouch for their, their compost, Jared, but I have used their, um, their potting mix, and it's the best potting mix I've ever had. It's, yeah. I, I, I have not talked to a single professional grower who has used it and not used it and then said, is there a difference? And the answer is always yes, and mm. Vermont compost is always the best. And the best part really about it is if you call in and ask to talk to the agronomist, you just get Carl Hammer, who's the owner and proprietor who's worked there for 30 something years. And you could, he'll just talk your ear off for an hour and a half about 
like I don't know, everything. <laughs> Okay, Al, I think we should probably call it a night. It's 8.30. Hey, I, want to, uh, I see Paul is on the call right now. And uh, I, I, I don't know if you were on when I said this last week. And I know not many of us left. But Paul, for, for years, has done our flyer for this course. And I know the flyer uh, wasn't really relevant. I mean, we did it on this year. It wasn't really relevant because we had all the advertising for the in-person course. But thank you, Palma. Um, and I'm glad you, you made it. Well, I've been really interested. I'm, I'm really not a farmer or much of a gardener. So for me, this is like opening some brand new, you know, exciting vistas. So thank you very much. Okay. Great. All right. All right, guys. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Have yeah. a great night. You too. Hey, good night. Bye. Thank you for everything. Sure. <clears throat>